Hey, good morning. This is Natalie Bumgarner, and we are really excited that you joined us for the third of our Tuesday topic. So today it is all about seeds and transplants. So managing my research trials is an essential activity, and I am actually in the greenhouse this morning. This is one of our teaching classrooms, and I just brought in some of our supplies so that we could talk about seeds and transplants. I'm mostly going to be talking about vegetable transplants. We're going to bounce up to the Cumberland Plateau now and then to talk to Greg Upchurch. He's going to be talking about prepping fields, fertilizers, soil tests, and we also have Lee Sammons, who is our horticulture agent in Hardeman County, who has a lot of great information about annual transplants and selecting those. So it's all about seeds and transplants from across the state and across the different crops that we grow. So I am just going to start a little bit um, by talking about some of the basics of transplant production. And so what are the keys? We want high quality seed, um, good location, good containers, media, and of course the growing environment. So let's kick it off and we'll, uh, we'll start with seeds. So we want to select ones, seeds that have good disease resistance for the challenges that we often have in our own gardens. We want high quality, right? Recently tested new, if at all possible, but here we are in the middle of a pandemic and there's actually a a uh, challenge in getting garden seeds. So the question you might be asking is, tell me about seed storage. How long do seeds last? And so there are different categories. Um, we have some that are kind of our shorter duration storage seeds, right? Lettuce and beans, some of our medium ones like cucumbers and some of our cucurbits. Beets and tomatoes tend to be a little bit on the longer end of the spectrum, but the key is actually the environment in which we store our seeds, right? So a lot of times um, seed scientists will talk about the rule of 100, right? So it is the temperature plus the relative humidity of the area in which we're storing them. And we want that to be less than 100. So we have them in a 40 degree refrigerator and it's 50% relative humidity, then that is a good storage environment. We also want consistency. We don't, we don't want heat and moisture and then dry and cool. So maintaining those seeds in a consistent environment means that they're not going to pick up a lot of moisture and they're not going to constantly be going through fluctuations. Um, another question that often gardeners have is, well, should I refrigerate or should I freeze my seeds? So there are certainly very long-term storage facilities that do freeze seeds at very low temperatures. But for us as gardeners, we often don't need those kinds of mechanisms. A good refrigerator with a consistent humidity and not a lot of fluctuations will get us the year or two or three that is useful for us as gardeners. Another important thing to think, keep in mind about freezing is that our goal is to keep that moisture percentage of our seeds low. However, we don't have a good way to test that. And if it tends to get too high, then freezing and actually, of course, freezing those water molecules inside those seeds could actually damage them. So um, a nice sealable glass jar, something that has a desiccant in it, can be a very good storage system. And also, you can use aluminum um, mailing envelopes. So aluminum will actually keep that moisture percentage lower, um, or some kind of a foil like you sometimes get in envelopes versus the paper. So that's seeds. Uh, we want high quality. Uh, we want as fresh and viable as possible. Sometimes our germination can actually remain reasonable where the actual vigor of the seeds can decrease over time. So sometimes those are actually different. Um, the next thing we want to think about is containers that we seed in, right? So you can get seed in a lot of different containers as long as they are clean, right? We want them to be sterilized. Um, solid flats, uh, we do want these to have holes, right, for drainage, very crucial. Um, lots of times what I will seed in um, is these divided small seedling trays because what it allows me to do is get a lot of different cultivars in my seeding trays. And so these are some young tomatoes that are just starting to show true leaves and I'm going to be transplanting them in the next couple of days. These transplants are in what we call a germination mix. And so it has fine particle sizes, it holds water well, drains a little bit slower, and so it's good for these smaller containers early on. Now when we put them up in larger containers, right, for the transplant stage, we'll use a larger particle size mix, right, because 
these really fine mixes that we use for germination might dry out too slowly in these containers. And so we're selecting based on particle size. Um, here we have really fine vermiculite, fine perlite, and small peat moss. Here we have larger pieces of perlite, possibly some vermiculite, and some larger pieces of peat moss or sometimes even composted pine bark. We always want to use a clean, nearly sterile, right, is kind of the way that we describe a seedling mix. We want to spend the money to get a high quality mix. I have some uh, different kinds of pro mix back here. Lots of times they'll also have a little bit of fertilizer, which can be good to get our young plants started off well. They can have a wetting agent, which helps us when working with peat moss, which tends to wet slowly. And sometimes they might even have some mycorrhizae in them, so we can help with some of the biological components. When our plants get up to about true leaf size, we can transplant them into a larger container. Um, so good seed selection, good container tray selection, good media selection, and then of course we have the environment. And so when we're talking about managing the environment around our crops, we want appropriate temperatures for germination. We're gonna send you some information on some of those, right? But warm and cool season crops, really important to give them the optimum temperatures. And then lots of times the grow out temperature will be just a little bit lower than what that optimum germination temperature was. The other thing we want is good air movement, which helps dry out the tops of the media. In fact, this is actually an example of something that we don't necessarily always want, right? So here you can see a little bit of algae growing on top of our media. That means it's staying in an environment that's just a little bit too moist. So we do want the tops of our um, containers to, grow, to dry out a little bit. You can see, I want my media to be a little bit dry on top. And when I water, I want to water well, right? I want it to actually drip out the bottom. I want to wet this whole uh, growing area. Here we have good um, root material growing all the way down, you know, not, uh, not too root bound. And so that helps us um, create root systems all through the entire growing container, uh, but not keep them too wet. We want to make sure that we plant our plants in a tray at about the same size. This is a really good example. This is a tray full of peppers. You can see here on the end, we have some really small peppers, right? They were a lot younger. They were smaller when they went in this tray. And so they're actually just really getting shaded and dwarfed by these larger plants. So we want them to be well matched um, so that they will get even growth. And we want them to be growing under good light conditions, right? So um, whether we have a home greenhouse, which can provide good light, or whether we actually need to provide supplemental light, we want to get appropriate temperature, good air movement, media drying consistent, but not overdoing it on the water, and good light in our growing environment. So that's what's going on inside when we think about good transplant production. We'll come back to this with a little bit more discussion about selecting good transplants, some of our annuals, some of the ways that we harden off our transplants. But before we get too carried away with that, let's talk a little bit about soil preparation. And for that, we have Greg Upchurch coming to us live from the Cumberland Plateau. I've got a, a couple of uh, different implements of destruction, you might say, out here in terms of a big turning plow and a small box tiller here that I've done some tillage in both things. Now, what's going to be interesting enough, the first thing that I'm going to probably tell you, and here I've, I've tilled all this soil up and done some different things, is minimize your tillage. Uh, a lot of times when we start really over prepping sites, we can actually uh, collapse those soil profiles and they can condense and press down and the soil aggregates uh, that we can have in that soil profile can actually go away. Our number one thing for building soil structure is actually going to be plant material. And so we want to really work hard to build up a soil profile. Now the garden I'm standing in uh, here, the actual spot that I'm at right here right now, we didn't have anything uh, planted in it. We mowed it off back over the summer. You can see a little bit of uh, clover that's, that was in here uh, through last summer. Maybe some winter annuals behind me, kind of on the lower edge of an older uh, garden site down here. But what I'll be doing this year is coming in, uh, tilling all this back down. And part of this I'll put back into uh, plant material to grow bees, to feed my bees in the hive just right over here, uh, just beyond the camera range. 
uh, and our ve uh, vegetable garden plot. So why would I till it then? You know, if I'm talking, the first thing I'm telling you is minimize tillage. Really work not to till. And a lot of our larger scale uh, commercial agriculture, that's what we do. We've gone to minimum tillage where we no till. And so we really don't ever plow the ground up. Once we get a good uh, plant basis on that, then we maintain that uh, plant basis and let it form the structures of the soil. However, you may have a garden spot. Maybe there's never been a garden there. Uh, maybe it's been a garden and, and it's been tilled to death over the years. And so a lot of times I might come in and use this big turning plow uh, to actually control uh, the uh, to get down deep and actually till into the soil profile and turn that soil uh, deeper so I can uh, basically break up any hard pads. And so my little uh, nephew here may be helping me here some uh, out in the garden as well. And so what we're going to try and do is till a lot deeper into the soil profile to actually break up those hard pans and then basically mix some of this top material down deeper into the soil profile to where we actually work and build that soil profile a lot deeper into uh, our garden. So what we're doing is I'm taking all that parent material and turning it down into the soil profile. Now you can see probably the big difference is here in our camera, get them up a little closer here to where we can kind of see the difference between our, our surface soil, our top soil, in this garden spot, that's about 10 inches. In our subsoil, which you can see is a lot lighter in terms of color, I'm trying to get this darker material and organic matter deeper into the soil profile. So that'd be one reason why, why I would come in and plow this deep and try and get as uh, much organic material deeper into the soil profile that I could. The other thing that's gonna be very important is to, as I come in, broadcast out my lime for homeowners, I'm going to tell pelletized lime and also my plant food that in that site prep, I'm going to get that distributed, plowed in uh, and basically get that growing site. So whenever Natalie, Dr. Baumgartner, we get those seeds and when Lee Sammons talks about these transplants, that we're ready to go with those plants in there. The plant nutrient, the food is in the soil. Uh, the pH has altered the environment to where that plant is set up and ready to go. Uh, everything that we have there is ready for that plant to utilize. And so I'm going to take that, till deep, get organic matter in, put my lime in there, put my fertilizer on, till everything in. And then from that point on, hopefully I can move to where I truly year after year minimize any tillage whatsoever. Maybe just small strips tilled into this soil profile to actually plant my seeds. And so uh, tillage can be very important, but I know a lot of gardeners can really overdo it in terms of tillage. And actually it's a practice that we're letting the soil uh, or the plant material do a lot better job in terms of building the structure of the soil. And so as I pull this out and look at it here, you can see lots of the different heads and how that breaks apart. Uh, so we've got lots of rooting material and those pads are very friable. And so the more I till this over time, uh, the less that that's going to be there. So minimize tillage, recognize it's, it, it has its place. It's important in circum, uh, certain circumstances, but ultimately the number one thing that we wanna try and keep on our garden spots is vegetation and plants and letting it do the rooting and building that soil structure for us. So uh, one last thing I would tell you, a lot of times when people and gardeners start talking about the difference between plowing and tilling, the one thing that I've got here, this is a, a kind of a, just a box tiller, a six foot box tiller, basically a regular garden tiller uh, on steroids you might say. And when we get that garden tiller, its purpose is it's going to work the very top of that soil real fine, real loose, where I've got a, a nice planting bed. But that box tiller, really, if I make two or three passes, about as deep as that box tiller is going to till this, 
is somewhere between two and maybe four, four and a half inches. Whereas you can see with a turning plow, it's gonna be a lot more dramatic. We're gonna get deeper down underneath that so we can turn that over. So box tiller, scarify the top, makes for a nice seed planting bed. The rest of this garden, when I was talking about planting my beef food, is probably what I'll do is just put a little bit of a uh, nice, uh, uh, just scratch the top of the surface, broadcast my seeds, and I'll let Mother Nature do the rest. This to the right of me here, on my right, uh, is gonna be a lot more, a uh, lot more of a job for me to work that material up and get it back into a seed bed. So minimize this, but it's pretty important that we can use that from uh, year to year. So hope that answers a lot of questions about uh, kind of tillage and things like that. Last thing, a lot of times, one of the main questions that we get from a gardening standpoint is, what kind of fertilizer do I need to use? Uh, UT at UT Hort, we've got lots of publications out there. And we've got some in particular on plant nutrition, garden fertilizing, how to feed those plants, what's what, but there is no substitute for a soil test. And so the one thing that I would tell all of you, get your soil test, take the guesswork out of it, and with that soil test, we can make uh, recommendations uh, as to what you need to be doing at what stage of, of plant growth. Now, soil test maybe doesn't have to be done every year, every three to five years will work. Uh, and you can work off that one that you do for that time period between soil tests. But there is no substitute. If you look out here in TV land and look and try to get an idea of what the soil pH might be in this, really there's no idea. Uh, we might use crop and vegetation, and how vegetation and plants doing is some indicator of pH, but ultimately until we really do that soil test, it's hard to say. Now, I know a lot of you on here probably watching today may be uh, working in raised beds. The one thing that I would tell you from a raised bed standpoint is don't confuse a soil test with a growing media test because those two are gonna be dramatically different uh, in terms of how we run that analysis. And if we've got a composted type uh, organic bed that we're trying to do a regular soil test on, well, one, UT is probably gonna send it back to you. They might do a growing media test, but they can't do a soil test on growing media and vice versa. So it's really important to get, if you're gonna use growing media, to get that test done so you can have an idea of where you're at. Uh, I know a lot of homeowners, when they do a growing media test, they think a lot of the compost uh, is really high in organic. And a lot of times uh, that, that compost is not gonna be as high in plant nutrients, plant food, as probably what you would think it would be. Now that growing, or that growing media, that organic compost is gonna be great in terms of improving the tilth and softening that soil, creating aggregate for roots to grow down through, a uh, critical component, but actually in terms of just pure feeding the plant, maybe not as much uh, as there as you might think. So it's important to get that growing media uh, test. So I well, hope that answers a lot of questions on that. Dr. Bumgarner, chime in there. Any questions? Yeah, I was, I was gonna say that, that sometimes when we talk about compost, they might actually be like a one, one, one type of analysis. So great to add water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity, but may not provide all the fertilizer that you need. But one thing I was thinking about, Greg, as you were talking about the difference between your box tiller and your plow was the fact that sometimes we talk about tillage actually can create a, a hard pan. Yes. And I was yes, thinking about, you know, year after year with a tiller that's only going, you know, two to three to four inches. I didn't know if you wanted to address that a little bit. No, that, that's exactly correct. And so uh, this garden hasn't been turned like to my right in a long time. And so both, most of the time, all we do is basically scratch the surface, get deep enough that we can have a furrow deep enough to, to plant. We try to keep the garden in terms of vegetation, some type of vegetation. I'm not as concerned. Of course, we really kind of mow it off and keep it pretty clean. And so other than a few wimmer annuals in the clover, you're, you really don't see much else in, in the way of, of weeds. But Dr. Bumgarner is exactly right. If year after year after year after year, if I do just tillage uh, very shallow, I can create a hard pan 
which is a impermeable layer that basically will not let those roots kind of grow down through them. So I can come back and I can use that uh, deep plowing basic, basically to flip that over. Uh, in or our some sand, radishes or something, right? Cover crop yes. could actually be an option too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I was going to say. NRCS will tell you anytime you plow, you're basically creating hard pans. And so I would tell you to focus on trying to use vegetation to get those roots deeper down in the soil profile. A lot of these new trends now, as we get this in uh, uh, wheat or rye or something, letting that stuff basically almost to the point of maturity, an annual, and then coming in or rolling that, crimping it over, creating an organic mat uh, that uh, we can just maybe cut us a little slit or poke our holes in to plant our seed, and that uh, cover crop actually serves as our weed barrier out here. Now, one thing about, again, getting back to the tillage, if I've done my soil test, and this would particularly be, as you see, an orchard behind me here, if I do my soil test and I know that that pH is low, well, if I just broadcast this pelletized lime here, and that's what I'd recommend for a homeowner, if I broadcast pelletized lime on top of this, it really doesn't start uh, impacting the soil until it works its way down to that soil profile and actually comes in contact with those soil pads to neutralize or actually raise the pH of that soil. So it's a very, very, very slow process. If I'm in an orchard or a vegetable garden and I know I need the lime, I can broadcast that lime over this and when I work it in, bang, I've got that lime down in the soil profile to where it's coming in contact. So in terms of altering the pH, it'll work much faster by tilling it in. But it doesn't displace the fact that I can, if I'm using organic no-till pro process and I've got wheat, or some other cover crop that I cramp, I can throw my plant food on there, let water work that into the soil profile. Uh, again, parting words, just remember, the more you till, the more you lose that good broken structure uh, and the pliability of that soil. You don't want it collapsing. So minimize the tillage, recognize it has an important place and an important time, but minimize tillage the best you can. Hey, um, Greg, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box, so I'll just go ahead and, and throw okay. them out there and we can kind of talk about them because they are uh, about tillage and soil management. So one is about using a broad fork uh, for breaking up hard pans. And there may be some folks who, you know, who have experience with that and we'd love to hear your comments. I guess I would say if you can get under uh, yeah. the hard pan. <laughs> yeah, I, and, I, and I tell you, the one thing, and like this, the little tractor I've got right here is a, a 34 horsepower, 32, 34 horsepower tractor. If you want to know how much horsepower your tractor's got hooked to a piece of tillage equipment like this, and actually, truthfully, I need to take one of these off and just use one plow because uh, you set that thing in deep for it to really plow and turn deep. Uh, it'll stall a tractor out or spin it out. You, uh, it's really hard. So the deeper that we can pull into that and turn that soil over, you know, uh, ideally I'd like to get this plow down to 10, 12 inches to get that organic matter to where I get more organic matter deeper into the soil column to where I have more moisture. So if you, if you can use, if it's a small site and you can use, uh, a fork like that and get deeper, yeah, you can do that. But again, uh, it, it takes some horsepower, either human or tractor-wise, when you start really getting deeper into the soil profile. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So um, the other question that's in the chat box is about, and you, you think about the, the plowed ground there on your right, our left, and the question was kind of about, well, what are you going to do next? And so you might want to mention, you know, about disking versus other other options. Okay. So uh, ideally, and I, I told Dr. Bumgarner before we got on here, I've got a big bog that I'd like to run that bog over and kind of break that up to level it out before I get into using this. Again, this is just a, a, a overgrown tiller. Okay, just happens to be on a tractor, and I've got a big walk behind tiller out in the garden. Uh, this would not be good to be trying to walk that walk behind tiller out and breaking all those up. So, I'd ideally like to take a disc or some type of bog, 
uh, that had bigger blades and kind of cut that and level it out, to break those heads up. And then that'll still give it some soil structure. That's not gonna break all these clods up. And so it's gonna still be pretty loose and pliable down to the soil profile. And then ultimately I'll come back in and I probably would have hit this elect uh, this morning with a tiller just to kind of level it out so you can see, but uh, we got a rain last night. And one thing that I would tell you is you don't want to plow, you want to have moisture uh, when you're tilling that garden, uh, but at the same time, you don't want it too wet because too wet makes clots and it's hard to work. Uh, if you till it too much and get it too powdery, a lot of times you can actually dry all the moisture out. And so you can have a, an environment that there won't be enough uh, uh, moisture in the soil for you, good seed germination. So again, don't overplow it, but work that out, smooth it out some. Uh, one thing that I would mention, it's really a little bit off uh, target, that one thing, and I might hand the camera around here a little bit later, you'll see where I've kind of got a raised berm here. I could actually use this tillage uh, equipment right here by making one pass one way and coming back and rolling that soil to get to uh, together, almost like a hay windrow, but I can actually windrow that soil up if I want to make a raised bed, just strictly out of soil. I can actually use tillage equipment uh, to build that raised bed in a garden. So great questions. You, you all know that uh, small seeds can get to be a challenge, right? So, um, so whether or not you're doing raw seeds or whether you're doing pelleted seeds, these are both lettuce right here. And so you can see the raw seeds versus the pelleted. Now lettuce, no matter how we use it, is going to be on the kind of the small end of our storage life, right? So a year or two is gonna be what we're talking about as far as the storage uh, life for lettuce. I did wanna uh, share with you a couple other kinds of pelleted seeds. These guys right here are actually a multi-pellet seed. So they have a lot of different um, kale in there. Now, most of the time what homeowners are gonna be using would be what we would call um, raw or untreated seed, right? So this doesn't have um, any fungicide or anything on it. And as long as we are using appropriate moisture and germination conditions, we can get um, you know, good germination out of, uh, out of untreated seed. But keep in mind that when we talk about, you know, what do peppers really like for germination? Well, you know, 75 to 80 degrees. And so if we're trying to germinate those in 60 or 65 degree temperatures and, uh, and they're germinating slow, then this raw seed, we could lose plants uh, faster. Um, I do have a little bit here. So um, these are what we would think of as treated seeds. So these have a little bit of thyrum in them. So that's one of the common fungicides uh, that we use. Now, if you're gonna be handling these, you know, follow directions as far as um, whether you need to use gloves and those sorts of things. But for some of our, especially, uh, warm season crops seeded a little bit early or, you know, transplant crops that were trying to get going early in the season, a little bit of seed treatment can be useful. Now, maybe you don't particularly want to use a traditional fungicide. There are some biological options. Actinovate is an option that, um, that can work well for you. We've had some, there have been some trials around the country that have showed that that biological option, which is a streptomyces, um, can actually be good as a seed treatment. So you have, you have some good uh, options there. Um, I wanted to get back just a second while we had some packets here and talk a little bit about the storage information, right? So some good examples here, these are aluminum. Uh, so foil bags will do a better job of keeping the uh, moisture low. These uh, paper bags don't really do much as far as um, preventing our seeds from gaining moisture over time. So think about what you're putting them in, um, now, plastic bags, right, could be good if our seeds are already low moisture, but if they are not, um, then that could actually be a detriment. So, you know, think about um, how we're, you know, how we're storing those and what the moisture content is. I've got a few seedlings back here that I just kind of wanted to, um, to show to you now. You may be still in the mode where you're starting a few transplants, and it is not too late uh, to start vegetable transplants, but you also might be um, in the stage of getting ready to purchase plants or start to harden off and move your own transplants outside. So I wanted to show you um, a few transplants. And these, um, as you can tell, they're, you know, they're pretty good, they're pretty good sized. 
And I still, you know, pretty good uh, stocky plant here. You can see nice deep green color. So we are about the 21st um, of April here. And you know what, the 22nd of April is actually the 90% frost free date uh, for the Knoxville area. So we're getting close um, as far as uh, when we can get plants in the ground. But it's not just frost, right? It's also uh, soil temperature. I've got a soil thermometer that I left in my own yard overnight. And when I got up this morning, I looked at it and it said 59 degrees. Now we think about this young plant and we think 59 degrees, you know, how much are those young roots gonna grow at 59 degrees? And the answer is not very much, right? So root growth for um, tomatoes, peppers, warm season crops between 55 and 65 degrees is really not that high. And so um, it'll probably be a couple of weeks before I get these in the ground. Um, and so we take environmental conditions into consideration. We also wanna take into consideration whether or not these plants have been hardened off. And so um, these are coming right from the greenhouse. And what I'm starting to do is letting them dry down just a little bit more. You can see here, I've tried to let my uh, soil completely dry out between waterings. And so when we talk about hardening off, um, what, what are we really talking about? Well, there are several ways that you can harden off plants, right? You can reduce their nutrition, which is, not the best recommended way because you can actually really slow down their growth and random um, interesting fact um, tomatoes actually start initiating their blooms and their future fruit production at about three leaves right so these guys are already thinking about bloom production and if we run them short on nutrition or get them too cold we can disrupt uh, early fruiting so we talked a little bit about nutrition. Temperature is another way that we could harden off, right? Um, but if we get these um, warm season, chilling sensitive crops, you know, sub 55, sub 50 degree temperatures, we can actually induce cat facing and some physiological disorders in those young fruit that we can't even see yet. So yes, I do want to lower the temperature a little bit, but I don't want to lower the temperature dramatically, right? So I'm not going to put them out tonight. I might put them out tomorrow night or the next night when we start uh, to get some 55 to 60 degree temperatures. So what's my personal best route to harden these guys off? It's managing uh, their watering. Or, you know, if I were really um, always on target, I'd probably start them a little bit later. These guys are on the edge. They're going to be plenty big enough when we get our plots ready in Knoxville. Um, as will these larger um, pepper plants uh, as well. So. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to show you while I'm up close, um, when you're looking at plants, whether they're your own that you're getting ready to put in the garden or whether they're in a garden center, right? We wanna look for um, deep green color. We wanna check for any sorts of, uh, of insects. And um, where are the aphids gonna be hiding? They're gonna be hiding right in the growing points um, of our young plants. I don't know if you could see some aphids in there. Oh, there's some, there's some right there right so um in our uh, university greenhouses we always have the opportunity to teach you lots um about uh pest control one of the most common questions that we get is white flies versus aphids and so right here what we have is an example of a cast skin of an aphid and so um he's not moving right um that's just that's just the shed exoskeleton if that was a white fly um he would he would fly away so um, so managing, keep them healthy, um, keep good nutrition, medium water, let those plants uh, dry out a little bit. It's going to be some of the best ways that we can prepare them uh, to go into the garden. Uh, but a lot of what Natalie has said about um, vegetables also applies to uh, the flowering plants. Um, one thing about planting seeds and starting transplants, your own uh, you may want to always calculate the calendar. A lot of our seeds take different uh, time or days for them to uh, germinate. And so some of them, uh, like uh, broccoli, if the right temperature uh, and cabbage may sprout in three to five days. Uh, some of our annual flowers are much different than our vegetables in that uh, it may take 10, uh, some things like gum freedom may take 20 days to actually germinate. Uh, even with the proper temperature. Most of our flower seeds, when we plant them, uh, take longer to germinate, and most of them like a higher temperature 
than our um, anywhere from 75 to 80 uh, degrees. So keep that in mind if you're going to grow some seedlings yourself uh, of annual flowers that they do need to be uh, backed up in time from, and calculate that uh, germination time also in the production time. Uh, so keep that in mind. But we can't grow everything as far as annual flowers from seeds simply because some of them are just such small plants, uh, seeds that we can't handle them. Uh, to give you an example, uh, begonia seeds are just very small like talcum powder. Uh, so it would be very hard for the homeowner unless you had some ideal conditions. Uh, begonias like these, which is your uh, Olympic red, uh, they were probably planted in December in a greenhouse to get them to be this size in the garden centers uh, now. So for you as a homeowner, that would not be a good annual to uh, choose to plant from seed. Uh, also, Natalie talked about pelleted seed. Uh, this is vial of pelleted petunia seed. Hope you can see it. But there's 500 seed in that vial. So they're just very, very fine. Um, and if you were planting petunia seed, uh, it would be very difficult. A lot of you, if you're doing that, a very small seed, you may want to mix it with like some sand or something that way. Uh, so you have a carrier with that seed and it's not just all dumped out in one uh, spot. Some, but the, some of the plants that are difficult to grow from uh, seed would be begonias, petunias. Uh, people like to grow pentas and they take a long time uh, to grow from seed. And that's why you buy most of those type plants in the nurseries and garden centers uh, in uh, already cell packs or four inch pots or something uh, that way. Uh, but there are plants that we can grow from uh, seed that do very well. Uh, those that you can handle like your uh, sunflower seed, they're very easily handled, uh, can be grown for seed. Uh, also your uh, zinnias can be transplanted uh, very easily uh, from seed because uh, they can be handled. Uh, I don't know if you can see these, uh, but that is your uh, zinnia seed. Uh, they are treated uh, and they are a hybrid uh, seed or your dreamland. Uh, a lot of people want to save zinnias from their uh, garden from the previous year and uh, we have trouble bacterial leaf spot on our zinnias that we save from seed uh, because it is a seed borne disease and you would need to uh, treat that and you can do that by using like a 10% solution of um, Clorox and water uh, to soak the seed for about 30 seconds to a minute uh, and that will kill the bacteria that's on the seed uh, born. Uh, now a lot of us like to grow cut flowers and we can grow uh, cut flowers a lot of them from seed because we're planting them later than we do uh, some of our early annuals that we plant. Uh, to give you an example of the um, Dreamland Zinnia seed that I showed you, uh, this is a Dreamland Zinnia uh, plant. It is really a good cut flower. Uh, a lot of your uh, farmer's market to sell uh, zinnias and cut flowers, it's the dreamland uh, zinnia that they're uh, planning to grow for cut flowers. The old state fair uh, zinnias that we had uh, have a lot of bacterial leaf spot and uh, other problems uh, on those. Um, but uh, love everything that Natalie said about the growing environment is very important. Uh, it's the same thing in starting seeds um, or about annuals and our perennials. Now, you want to uh, select high quality transplants when you go to the nurseries and the garden centers uh, and that you want a plant that is healthy, one that is growing good, showing no disease uh, symptoms at all. Uh, but you also want to be careful not to buy something that may be root bound. And if you're buying plants that may be root bound where the roots are continually going around the um, cell pack, uh, make sure when you get ready to transplant that and you set it out that you rough up these roots and break up that uh, cluster of roots so that they'll start new groups that be growing out into your uh, beds and your annual. Also make sure that you don't plant it too deep into the landscape. Uh, and if you're mulching your bed, make sure that you're planting in soil, not in the mulch. Uh, sometimes you may have mulched your beds over winter 
uh, and you have a two to three inch layer of mulch and you get to planting and you just plant the uh, transplant in mulch, knock down into the soil. So make sure that you're actually making uh, contact with the soil when you're planting those transplants. Uh, but like Greg was saying, you want to bed, uh, even if you annuals, you want your bed uh, work where the soil is loose when you plant it and maybe a trial or whatever, uh, loosen up and uh, need to put like some osmocote or some uh, garden fertilizer, depending on how large your bed uh, is in the landscape. Uh, sunflowers, uh, this one is not grown from seed, but it is a cutting. Uh, just talking about annuals, I have to tell you a little about some of the new things that's out there. Uh, this is called Suncredible. Uh, it is in the sunflower family. Uh, look for it in your garden center and nursery. Uh, this is a new hybrid by Proven Winners, and uh, it will produce over 100 flowers uh, in one season from one plant. Uh, but you can grow annuals from seed. A lot of our wildflowers we can seed, uh, but you're waiting till the soil temperature is in, gotten up into 70 degrees uh, and it's not uh, mud from all the rain that we've been having here recently. Uh, so those are some of the things to keep in mind when you're planting or seeding uh, annuals um, in the landscape. Natalie, will you? Hey, uh, Lee, uh, I just want to confirm and make sure. Were you talking about Sun Credible, the new helianthus, or was that another kind right, of Right, that's right. Okay. Yeah. That's from cuttings. That's not from seed. Yeah, and so um, Sun Credible, if you, well, we, we may have to do a virtual garden tour, but I know <laughs> that Jackson had it. Some of the other locations of our UT gardens had that, a new vegetatively produced sunflower that was just a gorgeous landscape plant. Yeah. Right. Most of our sunflowers that we as individual plant from seed produce one flower um, and you can buy those that uh, cut flowers don't produce a pollen. Uh, and, uh, um, those of us who like to grow uh, flowers from birds and uh, seeds, sunflowers are a good crop for kids to plant in the garden too. Uh, yeah and when it comes to pollinators one of the things that we want to keep in mind about sunflowers is some of the newer cultivars are actually pollenless because they've been bred right. and developed for the cut flower market. So you might want to get some old fashioned cultivars to get more branching and to, to get more um, pollen. Um, we just had a few uh, questions. Um, Celeste, feel free to um, talk and chime in if you've got um, anything to say. We had um, some folks asking if there was any um, special treatment as far as cosmos. They're they're pretty straightforward to germinate, right? Right. Yeah, um, easy, but might want to wait a week or two till the, the grounds warm up a bit. And um, I, think, I think that was it, the stuff that I was, oh yeah, we also have a publication. Uh, we have our, our work group that, that Lee has been a part of. We have put together a list of annuals that are easy to start from seed. And we don't have that posted online yet because it hasn't officially gone through publications, but I think that we can share that with you all when we do, when Natalie sends out her follow-up email. Oh, yeah, I'm sure hot off we... the presses. In fact, if anybody has any feedback, we can, we can use them as reviewers. It'll be perfect. Yeah, that'd be yeah. awesome. Definitely. If, uh, cause we, Carol and I, Carol had worked on it a lot with us and she, um, and I have thought of things in the past few weeks, you know, that we forgot to put on there. And so we've added them. Um, and have that has been um, developing you know, as we go along. So definitely we'll include that and there'll be a lot of helpful information on there. Yeah, yeah, for those of us who, you know, work, you know, more with floriculture crops, getting some of those older garden varieties that we don't think of as much, we'll make sure they're on that list. That'll be, that'll be good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, we've got a question in there that was asking about some of the um, seed uh, sterilization techniques and I have a, a pub on that that I can send that has a little bit of information about hot water versus Clorox and how long um, so we can include that as well I don't know if you wanted to mention anything else about that Lee I don't know if you you know personally sterilize any of the seeds that you use we don't we don't do uh, any of that but a lot of times those garden varieties of uh, zinnias were really ones that they uh, collected seed, but they always had bacterial leaf spot really bad, and that's carried on the disease seed itself. Yeah. 
Well, and one of the things that, I mean, maybe sometime later in the season we'll do a, a seed saving. Um, but here in the humid southeast, a lot of those bacterial diseases, like sometimes it's hard to save seed that are completely clean. Most of our seed production takes place in the Pacific Northwest, where they have a lot more arid conditions. Um, so yeah, that's, and we've got some good questions in the chat box about potential future sessions on hay bale gardens. And Greg and I were talking about this. We, you know, we probably want to cover raised beds in a different uh, session. So yeah, I think that we can, we can definitely include those. So fragile that they, you know, can't transplant them well. And so they end up digging them up in clumps and just putting them in pots, but then, you know, it's too heavily populated. So what would be your thoughts on how to more successfully germinate herbs from seed? Um, so sometimes when I think about issues with having transplants that are so tender that they, they're breaking and being damaged, I sometimes think of that as a light issue, that we may not be growing stocky, strong seedlings, and it may actually be um, an environmental uh, condition. But Lee, I'll, I'll uh, turn the floor over to you on that one too. Yeah, I think it's more of an environmental, not enough light. And also they could be keeping them too wet uh, in that. And uh, some of the herbs are just really require a lot of light more than some of the other plants. But basil is one that can be very easily grown. But if you get into like lemon verbena and some of the others that are uh, a little bit harder to try to germinate on that. But it's an environmental situation, I would say. And then and and gonna, maybe also, we're, maybe we're just trying to make it more complicated than it has to be. Uh, they might want to just try doing some direct seeding, you know, when the soil temperatures get um, happy. And that way they don't have to uh, transplant, if you will, because they're already growing there, right? So um, that would just take out a whole nother, um, right. whole yeah. nother step in the process. That are going to be in a container you could actually start them inside and then move them outside when your conditions got appropriate and you wouldn't have to transplant. Sorry, Lee, I think you might've been gonna respond. Sometimes we try to start stuff just too early. We're too eager to go gardening and the climate environment is just not there. So, you know, a lot of times it'd be better to back it up a month than do it when the temperature warms up and it still grow off and do fine, just maybe a little later crop uh, in that. Yeah, one of my favorite examples, and of course, I'll, you know, I guess I'll go back to vegetables, is that it's 59 degrees, right? If I put my cucumber seeds out right now, on average, it might take them 13 days to germinate. But if I wait till it was 65 or 70 degrees, they could germinate in six or seven days. And so what's true for, you know, we can actually sometimes save ourselves time by waiting a little bit until the uh, soil gets warm. We had a couple of questions in the chat box that were talking about lighting in seedlings and I didn't get into that within a whole lot of detail but we can go ahead um, and mention that a little bit right now. I've actually got a couple of lights here with me and so uh, these are what we call um, T5s right so this is a fluorescent uh, light. This is actually an LED. I don't know if you can uh, see that real well, but this is an LED that can fit into a regular T5 fixture. And so if we want to give um, our vegetable or many of our flower transplants a high level of light that, um, that would replicate maybe what they're close to getting in the greenhouse, most of the time the distance for these lights would be in the six to nine inch range. So for example, a two bulb T5, about nine inches from the top of your seedlings would need to be on for about 14 hours a day to be able to get them high quality light. So distance, yes, and it can also be time, right? You know, if we, um, if we just have these on for a few hours a day, we're probably not giving our seedlings quite the intensity and, uh, and total volume of light that they would uh, require. Now, there are lots of expensive light um, measuring devices, but I also have some, you know, really um, inexpensive light uh, meters. This is actually, so if you're, uh, if you're a photographer, you're probably familiar with a Lux meter, but it can also measure uh, foot candles. And so I don't know if you can see that right there. So you can see I'm at like 40 to 50 foot candles right there. So for really high quality seedling production, we would want to get in the 800 to 1000 foot candle range for 14 to 16 hours a day. 
So what we have in just the you know, interior of our rooms is not going to be near um, enough light. So sorry, Lee, I, I, I took off there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Light, light is a big issue in trying to start seedlings in the home. Uh, and so it's really hard to do without good light. <laughs> yeah, light and, and moisture. You know, if we were to um, name some of the most common culprits for young seedlings, I think it would be overwatering, poor air movement, and low light conditions. Right. Um, well, we, uh, let's see what, oh, goodness sakes, it's, it's five till. Um, we've gotten lots of uh, great questions. Um, yeah, and we've got um, notes in the chat box about, um, you know, distance. And so is, as long as, you know, you're not burning your plants and, uh, and running into issues, then yeah, I mean, you can, you can keep them pretty close. And it also depends on what your ambient uh, light conditions are. Yeah, I, um, I have a little bit of information on some of those uh, light uh, conversions, so I'll try to include um, that, that seedling information as well. I, I see that Greg turned his camera on back there, so I don't know if he has any parting words or thoughts from yeah. the uh, plateau. A couple of things. Uh, while uh, uh, you all were finishing up there, I made a quick pass or two so you can kind of see, and I'll work the camera around to kind of have just one pass of the tiller basically work that up and then I've got the section over here that's not been tilled or turned and I'll wait to turn it. One last parting thing that I wanted, two things. Uh, the raised bed you can kind of see in the middle basically created an earthen raised bed by just using that turning plow to roll uh, the soil into it. Kind of gives you a little bit of an idea there. And the bed that we've got and how loose. The other thing that I would tell you would be really, really, really important if you're going to till the garden, till it up early. We won't do anything. We're not going to plant for another three weeks to a month here in the plateau uh, in terms of those warm season crops. And we'll let all this uh, clover and vegetation die down so it'll be incorporated in uh, uh, by the time we plant. I mean, I don't know how you can get any more in the moment than that. While we were talking, yeah. Greg was actually tilling to prepare his next demonstration. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and I, I'd say, Greg, if you've got, uh, you've probably got the opportunity to, you know, make a loop. Your Cumberland County Master Gardeners would love it if you just did garden tillage for the next couple you, of weeks. You think, do you think? You think they might? Yeah. I, yeah. I'll <laughs> see. I'll see about getting on to that. Mm. Um, the, we had a question about uh, the soil thermometer and, um, and actually I can, I can run out shot, I can run outside and show you just a second. While that is doing that, I might comment uh, about starting like your herbs and things a little bit later, like uh, Celeste said, direct seed uh, in some pots once it is warmed up. Uh, and you, uh, seedlings do better. So um, I don't, I've got a little bit of reflection there on my uh, camera, but, um, but um, I'm showing you what my, um, what my seedling, th my soil thermometer looks like right outside the building here. You can see right now we are at 61 degrees. Which is a little bit cool to be planning some things directly. Yeah. yeah. All right, so it is now um, 11.57 and we're closing in on our time today. Um, we'll go ahead and, um, and uh, close off this. We'll look through um, any future uh, questions and we'll try to send as much information to y'all uh, as we can. Um, so monitor your soil temperatures, get good soil tests, um, harden off your transplants and we will see you again uh, uh, next week is actually going to be all about herbs 
and uh, Melody's going to be leading it. So we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing everybody then.